Hi, and welcome to the continuing series of online documents for my Music Hum Section 24 class. I'm Brad. Uh, this is going to be for Thursday, April the 16th. And we're going to cover a number of composers. I'll have a few videos up for you to take a look at. Um, again, I'll try to keep each one a little small. Um, now, we've been kind of looking at two different threads that were happening in the 20th century, you know, the kind of the experimentalism avant-garde thread and the serialism academic kind of thread. And I don't mean to apply that, imply that this is all that was happening. I mean, quite a bit was going on in music. In fact, that's what makes this uh, period kind of interesting. Well, partly because we're so close to it still. We haven't had the funnel of history, you know. I wonder what the avant-garde music of Mozart's time sounded like. Anyhow, um, but... We're going to follow up some kind of offshoots of those threads and, and uh, you know, in the next couple of classes. And one in particular we're going to talk about today um, became fairly important in the mid to late 20th century uh, called minimalism. And the composers that were involved in this um, hated that title, but they all kind of agree, well, that's probably appropriate. You know, it reflected the kind of the minimalist movement in art that was happening at the time. You know, really pare down your materials, you know, work with something, you know, very, very focused. Um, and kind of there's a there's a perceptual, almost a spiritual aspect to it, too. You you focus on these things and you you internalize what's happening. But um, yeah, you'll, you'll hear that in this music, and let me just kind of jump right into it. The, the, the composer was considered kind of the godfather of minimalism, um, was somebody we've already encountered before, Lamont Young. And we, count, we encountered him um, back in, when we were talking about the avant-garde, um, the Fluxus movement. He was the famous uh, feed of bale of hay to a piano guy. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about his background and kind of what led him away from Fluxus towards this, his minimal works that he's doing now. He was born in 1935, still alive today, um, in a small town called Bairn, Idaho, out in the middle of nowhere. His parents were very devout uh, Latter-day Saints, um, and uh, he was brought up in a very strict household. But he soon left for a different kind of environment. He went to school at uh, UCLA, and became very involved in the jazz scene there. He was a very talented sax player. And he then fell from the jazz scene into kind of dealing with new music composition and was really intrigued by the by the music that, uh, you know, radical new composers, especially in academia, were doing. Went to UC Berkeley, and from there he went to a, a, a... They had a big festival in Germany called Darmstadt. They still have it today, where there's a lot of very serious kind of formalistic music that's being discussed and, you know, you know very strong kind of political overtones. And he really enjoyed it. He, he even met a guy named Karlheinz Stockhausen, we're going to talk about Karl Heinz when we start talking about electronic music, um, and became very enamored of the twelve tone system. Uh, now, yeah, yeah, imagine the, the feeding the piano straw guy with the twelve tone system. Um, but then he happened to meet John Cage, and it was a life changing event for him. Uh, Cage really kind of, you know, showed him different ways of thinking about music, ways that resonated with resonated with his kind of uh, the spiritual background, and. Um, yeah, he, he he followed Cage and moved to New York, where he made his home for the rest of his life, still there today. And um, that's where he got involved with the Fluxus movement. But in 1962, he met a guy who had come to New York uh, for, for a visit, Pandit Pran Nath. And he had a profound influence on minimalism in general, through Lamont Young and through another guy we're going to talk about in a bit, uh, Terry Riley. Um Pandit Pranath was a, a, a Pakistani classical singer who specialized in very, very slow, slow music. Uh, and Lamont Young, when he heard this, when he started working with the singer and began to appreciate what the singer was after, what Pandit Pranath was after in terms of you know his musical utterances, just became totally enamored and enraptured and completely changed the way he thought about music. And it's funny because he, he thinks about music as, again, you know, connecting to his childhood. He said one of the most profound musical experiences that he recalls was listening to um, an electrical transformer all night long, kind of making that weird buzzing sound that you hear sometimes from these things. And uh, he started fashioning music like that. He created this thing that he called the Theater of Eternal Music. 
And basically, he started writing compositions that were intended to last years with, you know, chord movements, you know, once every several months or so. So again, this is what people would term minimal music. And uh, I'm just going to play you a little bit of, of, again, this has to be an excerpt from one of his pieces. And it's got this, uh, this uh, great title, okay? The Second Dream of the Step Down, High Tension Line Step Down Transformer. Uh, so this is uh, from his Theater for Eternal Music. I'll start it up and you can give it a listen. Okay, now I'm going to run it ahead a little bit. Uh, this is about um, 30 seconds into the piece. And I'll run it ahead a little bit more. This is about 50 seconds. And I said seconds, I meant minutes. Okay, 50 minutes into the piece. And this is a little bit over an hour into the piece, and they could only fit an hour and 16 minutes onto a CD when this was released. So you can hear this is actually made for performers. Um, and again, they're very, very long pieces. Uh, you know, usually performance isn't going to last for months, um, but it will, you know, take place over 12 hours or something. He formed an ensemble called the Forever Blues Band, which uh, consists of people that could play this sort of music and were kind of in sync with what he was trying to do. Um, but the thing that he's done that's his probably most lasting monument is he established a foundation um, with his wife, uh, Marion Zazila. She was a visual artist that did a lot of work with light. And they have this place called the Dream House. Um, it's sponsored by the Mila Foundation, which is his kind of fundraising arm. And you can actually go there today. It's at 275 Church Street. And basically, it has, it's electronic, so it can go on, and it instantiates his pieces that are intended to last for years. And in fact, it has been going for years. It's a remarkable experience. If you really want to have a very uncommon evening, um, go online. I'll put the link on the website. And... Uh, Make a, make a reservation to go down there. It's free. Um, and just experience this thing because it's not like anything else that you're going to find much in New York. So we're going to talk about Terry Riley in the next video. And uh, see you then.